Uh, two o'clock, I'd like to call to order the September 26, 2019 meeting of the RSW Regional Jail Authority. Um, we do have a few new faces, so if we could. So, I'd like Conrad, if we go around the table and do introductions. Uh, Conrad Mosley, Board of Supervisors from Shenandoah County. Dan Murray, Board of Supervisors, Warren County. Mike Arnold, Chair of Warren County. Brendan Hefty with Hefty Wiley, Warren Legal Counsel. Russ Gilkson, Superintendent of RSW Regional Jail. Stephanie Smith, Finance Manager of RSW. Mary O'Connor, Administrative Assistant, RSW. Chris Parrish, Board of Supervisors, Rappahannock County. Gary Curry, County Administrator, Rappahannock County. Evan Bass, County Administrator, Shenandoah County. Doug Stanley, County Administrator, Warren County. I'm Ted Cole with Davenport and Company. We're financial advisor to the Jail Authority. And Jesse Bowers with Sands Anderson. We are bond counsel to the Jail Authority. Max Garber, Northern Virginia Daily. Roger Van Kane, Royal Examiner. Mark. Mark Williams, Royal Examiner. Welcome to our guest. Next item is the adoption of the agenda. Any additions or changes to the agenda? Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the agenda as presented. I'll second. Second, Mr. Housley. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item three, adoption of the minutes of the July 25th, 2019 meeting. Are there any changes to the proposed minutes? Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the minutes for July 25th, 2019. Is there a second? No, second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item four is public comments. Public <coughs> comments are limited to issues that are not the subject of a public hearing. Intended as an opportunity for the public to give input on relevant issues and not intended as a question and answer period. Is anyone from the public that wishes to speak? Anyone from the public? Being none, uh, item five, comments from board members on legal counsel. Board members? Oh, sure. One. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to thank everyone for all their efforts from the building time when we were all involved, many of us were involved, till now. Next month, uh, next meeting will be my last meeting, and I just want to make sure I say thank you to everybody now. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Legal counsel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have anything at this time. Right. Item six, superintendent's report. Russ. Um, average daily population for Appahannock with 20 at 6%. Shenandoah County with 123 at 37%. One County with 186 at 57%. Total member jurisdiction 80 feet is 329. We currently have one contract bed from Prince William County, 62 from Page County, and call public with 98. Took bringing the total facility 80 feet to 490. Total officer vacancies are 27. This does include the eight positions held for vacancy savings, and we have one medical vacancy, which is an LPM position. Um, facility grounds and maintenance. Um, asphalt maintenance started on September 4th with the crack filling, resealing, and striking of the visitor and staff parking lots. The remainder of the paving areas are scheduled to be completed uh, the 28th and 29th, which is for this weekend. Um, recruitment and retention. We have uh, one officer that began on September 23rd. We have another officer scheduled to begin on October 7th. And we have a facilities assistant who is scheduled to begin on September 30th. Uh, there is one jail officer currently in background, and we have several others um, I'm being told by human resources that are completing applications for submission. MA Programs and Services on, on excuse me, August 29th, McShell Foundation hosted their uh, Virginia Rehabilitation and Recovery Summit at Mountain Home Bed and Breakfast in Warren County. Um, I was unable to attend the event, but I understand that it was a, a positive event showcasing the 22 recipients of um, scholarships from McShin to inmates of, of Warren of uh, RSW for their program, um, which what that does is it gets them a bed space at their facility um, in Richmond to continue on with their rehabilitation, helping them find a job, again, again continuing that support, um, providing housing and things like that. Ross, I just want to add, I had, did have the opportunity along with Mr. Murray to attend the ceremony, and uh, there was lots of praise for RSW even undertaking and participating with McShin in the program. So I thought it was a very um, enlightening program, and see some people hopefully that will stay on the straight and narrow. And um, you know, at the end of the day, 
to not come back here in an official capacity. So uh, congrats to the staff and all that. I know you put a lot of effort into it over the years in the setup. It, it, it's been a really good partnership with them, and hopefully, you know, the grant money is, you know, could, is supposed to continue for another year. Um, I don't know if there's going to be additional grant funding to help support that with McShone, but uh, we'll have to wait and see what the next year holds, and, you know, hopefully we can continue that success throughout this next year. What's the total cost of the program? Do you remember off the top of your I head? don't know. Okay. And again, that, you know, McShone's the one that, that you know, was the manager of that grant and received the funds, so I'm not sure what their cost is. Or, or Russ, every penny we spend on that is worth it. It's an excellent program, and the counties that are suing in the opiate issues should look at not using that money just for police, etc., but a percentage, maybe 30% should be set aside to support the McShim Foundation. We need that type of activity. You don't find that in many areas of the country, and we're blessed to have that. Additional information, we did continue to provide work in all three member jurisdictions. There's some photos in your packet outlining some of the projects that were being completed in each jurisdiction. Um, tomorrow, staff will be attending the World of Works um, Expo at Shenandoah University, which uh, is an annual event that's uh, hosted by Lord Fairfax Community College, um, showcasing or providing seventh graders throughout the region an ability to go around and you know, see different. Uh, career paths that they could possibly take from different, you know, businesses and government agencies. The counties that participate are Clark, Frederick, Page, Rappahannock, Shando, Warren, and the city of Winchester. So this will be our fourth year, I believe, participating in that uh, event, and we're, we're really honored to be part of that. That's all I've got. Any questions for us? All right, moving on. Financial report. Just over $516,000 was received from the Compensation Board in August for the July 2019 salaries and benefits reimbursement, of which just over $277,000 was for vacancy savings, both for the month of July and the eight positions that we hold vacant for the entire fiscal year 2020. Contract bed rental billing for August 2019 was just over $88,000 for Culpeper, um, just over $75,000 for Page County, and $1,500 for Prince William County. August is just over 16% of the year. Expenditures are at just over 13% used, and revenue is at almost 19% realized. Robinson Farmer Cox was on site to conduct the RSW Regional Jail FY19 audit on the 18th and 19th of September. Everything went well, and they stated that they should have their reports completed by November. I'm assuming, I know we changed the policy last year with regards to that rolling three-year average, and Bill actually produced the report in summer for that. just want to confirm that'll be part of that part of presentation. The true one. Any other questions on the financial report? I just had one question. Doug, the, uh, the eight vacancies that we keep open, that, when we originally did that, wasn't that designed to pay for inmate medical mainly? I remember. I don't remember it that way. I thought it was just a way of trying to trying to have some just savings in general for localities. General. Okay. Okay. All right. I guess I right, wrong, and different. We've never been close to that number in a while, but um, okay. Um, that was kind of uh, what we were anticipating to be to hold those positions open and be able to, uh, especially the first year we were kind of ramping up and hiring All right. staff. Okay. Thank you. Hearing no questions, is there a motion to approve the financial report? So moved. Second. Second. The motion by Dan, second by Conrad. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 8 is the bond refinancing dis financing discussion. Mr. Cole. Yes. There's uh, a few hard copies on the table, and then what is, your agenda should have it as well. And the, oh, I've got you too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, the cover should say September 24th on it, uh, for those of you that are looking in the packet. Um, Anybody, anybody down there need one? That oh, yeah. Yeah. Those yeah, are actually 24. September 24th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
Um, uh, again, I'm Ted Cole with Davenport and Company. Um, we serve as financial advisor to the authority, and Jesse Bausch, who's with Sands Anderson, serves as bond counsel to the authority. We're both here um, to talk about a potential refinancing of some of the RSW debt. Um, the bond issue that we're looking at um, dates back to 2012 when the authority first financed the facility through one of the state agencies called the Virginia Resources Authority. Um, there is an opportunity to refinance a portion of those outstanding bonds um, through the VRA program. Um, and there is a resolution for you all to consider today. Um, if you decide to move forward with and approve the resolution, then what will um, come from here is the Warren County Board will need to consider a similar resolution on Tuesday. Um, Shenandoah County Thursday afternoon and then the following Monday afternoon Rappahannock County so for this to move forward we need the authority and the three member jurisdictions to to approve that um, if we move forward the Virginia Resources Authority plans to sell bonds on October 30th that is the bond sale that this would be in, and they're looking at several other refundings as well, in addition to sort of the normal borrowings that they help facilitate. So between now and October 30th, uh, interest rates are going to move around however they might, and so the savings that might be recognized from this refunding are also going to move around, and we're going to talk a little more about that in detail. Um, but as of October 30th, if we're going to participate, that is the date at which what would be the 2019 bonds, the interest rates would be locked in and the savings would be locked in as well. Um, I'm talking off of now page one, there's page numbers in the lower right corner. Um, the authority issued a little over $45 million worth of debt in 2012. Those bonds mature in 2042 and they're fixed rate. The interest on those bonds will not change um, unless the authority chooses to move forward and, and do a refinancing like we're discussing. In 2012, it was established that the people that bought those bonds could not have those bonds called from them until 11-1 of 2022. So as a, once 11-1 of 22 comes, we are free to call the bonds from the current bondholders that was all agreed to in 2012. The bonds that are actually callable are the bonds that mature on from 2023 to 2042. So there are some bonds that we cannot refund. The ones we are eligible to refund start in 23, go to 42, but we can't actually take them out of the market until November of 2022. And I'm in the middle of the page. That is about, I'm gonna round up slightly, $38 million worth of the bonds. Remember, you issued about 45.2. The callable bonds are 38 million, and they have interest rates on them between three and five percent. Those are tax exempt bonds, which is what you would normally expect an authority like this to issue. 2018 tax legislation came through and it put some limitations on the type of refundings that can be done for municipal debt on a tax exempt basis. This is called an advance refunding because the bonds that we would sell in November of 19 would be put in an escrow. The escrow would be sized to the penny to make payments on the bonds until 11-1 of 22. It's called an advance refunding. Those have been around for a long time. Tax legislation in 2018 disallowed doing that type of refunding with tax exempt debt. So we just couldn't do it on a tax exempt basis that did not disallow doing it on a taxable basis. And normally you would say, I, you know, I, I'm having a hard time understanding how we're going to pay off tax exempt debt with taxable debt, but in the current interest rate environment, there are significant savings to be recognized by doing just that. So what this transaction is, it's an advance refunding of the 2012s that would be facilitated through VRA, the same issuer that you used in 2012, and it would advance refund about $38 million. Um, the bonds would be um, escrowed. They are legally defeased. You all as an authority don't have to worry about those bonds. You're not legally obligated to, for those bonds once this bond issue closes in November. And on 11-1 of 22, those bonds get paid off. Um, you'll be left to service the 
part of the 2012s we did not refund and what would be called the 2019s. Um, all other terms and conditions, uh, meaningful business terms and conditions um, that you're currently obligated to through DRA will remain the same. They're not looking to introduce any new covenants or requirements. They may update their documents here or there for sort of business, uh, not business, but tax law type things, but it doesn't affect you all in, in a negative way. Uh, we're not shortening the debt. We're not extending the debt. The debt would pay off at the same date that it would if you did nothing. So what's before you is a discussion about do we want to move forward with this? Is now the right time? Um, and the, the other question will be what is our minimum acceptable level of savings to get out of this transaction? Because again, we're about 30, 35 days away from October 30th, which is the date where the rates would be locked in. So if you look at page two, we've shown you under the current market with VRA, um, the mechanics of this transaction. And I'm going to talk off the left-hand side first. The first six lines are summarizing the bonds that we would be paying off or refunding. 37.9 million, rates range between 3 and 5%. They can be called in 2022 at par or 100%, no penalty. And again, it's the bonds that mature from 2023 to 2042. The middle, lines 8 through 13, are what the new bonds would look like, the 2019 bonds, if we did them today or as of a couple of days ago. We would actually have to issue about $41.9 million of debt. Um, it would have the same final maturity, 2042. Our interest rates, we have a couple of different ways to calculate the rates on lines 11 and 12. Uh, 271, 277, it depends on whether you include the cost of issuance in the calculation or not. And these 2019 bonds on line 13 would also have a 10-year no-call period. That's standard in, uh, in, in municipal debt offerings. Given where rates are and rolling in um, all of the costs in the escrow in the green, we are estimating that savings over the remaining life of the loan, which is about 23 years, would be about $8.7 million in total. In today's dollars, if we discounted those dollars back over to, uh, to today's uh, dollar equivalent, it's about $6.6 .6 million. And another way that we measure a refunding effectiveness um, is line 18, and we look at net present value savings. It's a percentage. We look at the net present value dollars, which is $6.6 .6 million, as a percent of the bonds we're refunding, $37.9 million, and we're at about 17%. That's a pretty strong percentage. As a point of reference, while there are no laws that guide this, it's, it's considered industry practice that a minimum of 3 to 5% is required or desired in order to consider a transaction like this. That doesn't mean you have to do it at 5%, but that's really kind of the entry level that people have tended to follow it over time. So we were, we're a multiple of that, and even if you say 6% or 7%, we're a multiple. You would recognize these debt service savings year by year. It's about $365,000 per year on average. That would be the savings to the RSW jail authority, and then that, those savings would flow through to the member jurisdictions according to your cost sharing arrangement on head counts and whatnot. Yes. Well, I've got a couple questions. The um, the six point six million in savings. I mean, how does that? How does this four million dollars that we lose by taking on a different debt? Where is that? How does that play in? Okay. So let, let me. I'm going to. I want to answer that, but I want to talk about that bottom left escrow statistics. Um, remember, if we close this loan in November of nineteen, we have to put money in this escrow to pay all of the debt on the bonds we're refunding and pay those bonds off in 2022. That escrow has to pay interest during the escrow period on the 2012 bonds at a 4.85%, right? Because that's what was established in 2012. We can only invest that escrow money in a certain type of treasury security. You're limited to what you can invest in. And in today's market, you can only earn a 158 on that escrow. So in order to put enough money in the escrow to pay interest and the 37.9, in 
and to account for we're paying out a 485 but we're only earning a 158 we have to put extra money in the escrow so that is that's the four million that's right now there's some cost of issuance that we footnoted in the bottom right that's contributing to the four million differential so how does that uh this 6.6 .6 million savings how does that do so you, do you subtract 4 million and say no, oh, we're only saving nope. 2.6 million good question no you so look at the right hand side the first column says net prior bond debt service that is if you do nothing leave everything in place like it is today and you amortize this loan through its final maturity. That was my other question. This is an amortized loan? Fully amortizing. You're paying principal every year and interest every year. Yeah, but in, in a typically an amortized loan, uh, the first few years are mostly all interest, right? So if we pay off early and we start over again, we're going to ratchet it back to where we're paying mostly all interest. We are, what the way your debt is set up is it's, it's annual principal and interest mortgage style. So you're right. Generally, on the front end of the loan, it's more interest and less principal, and as you go forward in time, it's, mm -hmm. it's becoming we'd more be start, principal. We'd be restarting the clock of paying mostly all interest the first few years. We are, we are sizing the new bond issue in a way that solves for level annual savings. So if you look at the far right, we are amortizing the new loan, the 2019 bonds, so that the savings are recognized on an annual basis. Yes, you're still going to have the early years that are more principal than, or excuse more me, more interest than principal, but I, I, I'm not sure you say we're going all the way back to where we were. It's, it's, it's on a relative basis about where you were now anyhow, and you could try to recognize the savings more front-loaded. You could try to recognize the savings more back-loaded if that was part of your strategy. Generally, it is set up the new debt so that the savings are roughly level year by year. We don't want to change our budget amount each year. It's flat. Right. It's less, and so to your point, if you look under the column that says net refunding debt service, that is the debt service for the 41.93 million of principal at current interest rates. That's a taxable loan fully amortizing. So yes, you have four million dollars more principal in that schedule than you do the one on the left but you've got less interest and the net difference is on a on a over time basis 8.7 million so we don't have to de deduct anything from that right um, when so you're looking at savings to the so authority. what is the interest right now it the interest right now is uh, the coupons right. that these tax exempt bonds are paying are between three and five percent. Each each maturity has I'm, a difference. What I'm getting at is what are, what's the interest that we're paying right now? That's what just saying. Between yeah. three and five percent. Between three and five. That's a pretty big range. So it's, it changes. It, it it not you've got you've got twenty three years left on this loan. Right. And every it's never going to change. But every maturity does not necessarily have the same interest rate. The 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 ones that are Sooner have a lower interest rate. The ones that are longer have a longer interest rate. I, let me show you. Did you print the appendix in there too? Sure. Yeah, I think you did. Mm -hmm. If you look, these are detailed numbers, and they there are page numbers. Just give me a minute. I think it's page two of appendix B. Page, page 11 of the very back part that's got, keep going, you gotta go deep into the presentation. Under B? Yes, under B for those of you that have tabs. And at that point, the pages are in the upper left corner. This guy. Upper right corner. These are the current bonds, and these are the bonds that we're paying off. Now, VRA has a senior, sub, senior and subordinate structure, but 
you're going to see when you look at the maturities from 11123 to 11-1 of 42, all of those are either 4 or 5% coupons. On the subordinated debt for VRA, they're between 3 and 5% coupons. So municipal bonds are sold with different interest rates or different coupon rates. And so that's why we say the current bonds are paying anywhere between 3 and 5% coupons. And we're talking about going into a taxable loan that as of a couple of days ago, had uh, a true interest cost of about a 270. Those bonds will also have different coupons. Um, they will have coupons that look more like page two in that section. Go to page two. You see there's still a senior and a subordinate. Um, but you'll see those rates, those, those range from anywhere from like a 170, not 75 to a 299. So these are the new coupons that you would have. That's where the savings are being generated. So the overall savings is about it, based on the rates of the 24th. Overall savings, principal and interest is 8 million. Principal is 4 million more, so the interest is... 12 million less. Yeah, right. About. Yep. So there's so much less, 12 million less interest, mm -hmm. more than makes up for the 4 million more principal. Correct. Over the life of the loan. Correct. So, yeah, when you when you look at it, if, you, if this were to happen, yes, the authority has, will have, would have $4 million of additional principal outstanding to repay, but at lower interest rates than it is today to the tune of. $8.7 million that you'd recognize over time, or a little over six and a half in today's dollars. Does that help? It helps. One other, um, one other question. Uh, so this total is like a, was this a 30 year or a 40 year? It was originally a 30 year transaction. 30 year, okay, and we are on what, what year now? Uh, 2012 to, so we're, years, we're about in year eight, seven yeah, or eight. Year eight, okay. And uh, if we do this transaction, the final maturity will remain the same. We're not shortening debt or extending debt. Uh, so it'll still be paid off in, in 30 years from the inception? Correct. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Okay. So that's page two. That's current market. On page three, um, we have started a progression of savings every time we look at this because we have had conversations with the authority um, and the, uh, the finance and personnel uh, committee and we'll be updating this periodically before going to the member jurisdictions. So we're just tracking this. Column B was where the savings were estimated back at the end of August. Um, column C was uh, mid-September. We saw rates go up and savings go down. And then we did it as of a couple of days ago, and rates are back and a little better than they, what they were in late August. So we're going to continue to see interest rates moving around, up and down. I'm on page three. Um, and you'll see the net present value savings on line three has been bouncing between 15% and 17.5%. And that will continue between now and remember October 30th is the date where that would be locked. And one of the things that is in the resolutions that you all will consider and the member jurisdictions is what level of net present value savings do you want to establish as the minimal, minimum acceptable level. Okay, And remember that pre net present value percentage saving is a measure of, it's the math between on the prior page, 6.6 .6 million in dollar savings divided by the 37.9 million that we're paying off. Okay? Um, if we could, I want to talk off of page four because I think one of the natural questions is, all right, well, how sensitive is this, is this refunding to movement and market? And what are our options? And, and one, certainly one option you can consider is to do nothing and wait 
and revisit this. This is not kind of a one and done window for the refunding. If you don't take advantage of it now, you have opportunities or may have opportunities in the future to do it. So all we've done on page four is we've restated the current market estimates under column B. Column C and D is just showing the sensitivity of an even 10 basis point movement in rates up or down. And it's fairly linear. So whatever the difference is in savings for 10 basis points, it's about double that for 20 basis points. So it just gives you a sense of how savings and percentage savings will change with market movement up or down. Column E is a moment in time that's roughly halfway between now and the call date. Remember, the call date on the 2012s is 11-1 of 22. We picked that and said, what if we waited to do this refunding until that date? And we would still have to do it taxable, unless tax law changes. And if rates were exactly where they are today on, a, on May of 21, you'll see under the bottom of column E, we could stand to uh, recognize a little over $10 million of savings, right? So if rates stay the same and you wait, you have an opportunity to do better. What we've solved for on this, on line four, is the break-even rate, which is about 25 basis points. And what that is telling us is if we decide to wait and rates go higher by more than 25 basis points, we would have been better off doing it now. If rates go down, obviously, or they don't go up by as much as 25 basis points, you would be better off waiting. That's the break even. And then we did it one more time at the call date in November of 22. At that point, you could do a tax exempt because it's no longer an advance refunding. If rates stay exactly where they are today, but you wait until 22, you stand to recognize about $12 million of savings. But if rates go up by more than 90 basis points, which is just shy of 1%, you would have been better off doing it sooner. So it's trying to give you a little perspective of, you know, waiting versus going now and what kind of, um, you know, risk are you taking on to, to interest rate movement. Um, bear with me if we could go to page five. Page five, we have restated the current market estimate in column B. That's the one we've been talking about. And then column C, D, E, and F is just showing you what the savings look like under different present value um, targets, right? So at 3% savings, remember, we're at 17% savings now on a present value basis. Um, at 3% savings under column C, total savings are about 1.6 million rates would have to go up by a full percentage between now and October 30th for that to be a result. 5% savings, 7% savings, and 9% savings. So it just gives you a sense of what the annual and total savings are under different present value thresholds because again, one of the parameters in the resolution will be what is your minimum acceptable level of savings and we're going to ask that to be quantified as a present value percentage number, okay? Um, and then uh, tab A, for those of you with the book, you talk about, all right, well, what is our risk of market movement, right? Um, one thing we know for certain is that the rates are going to move, and I would ask you to look at page 8 for starters. Um, Page 8 is tracking two different indices that have a potential bearing on this refunding. Um, the dark green is the 10-year treasury rate, which is a taxable rate, which is a good proxy for this taxable loan. And the gold is the 10-year tax-exempt rate. And what you're going to see, going back to 1999, is that both of them are pretty darn near the bottom. They're not at the absolute bottom, but they are very close. Um, and you can see they've been trending lower here in the last six to 12 months. Uh, they, they spiked up at the last election in 2016. You can see that. They've been up and down since the election. Uh, in the last 12 months, as I said, generally speaking, have been moving lower. So uh, we are much closer to the bottom than the average. 
Um, all things being equal, rates have more room to go up than down, but certainly don't know when and to what extent they're going to move. Um, we've been talking about rates having more room to go up than down for a while, and they have moved lower. So I, I don't know what rates are going to do between, certainly between now and October 30th, or now in 21, 22, 25, 28, whenever you might consider doing this. Um, you know, we talked a, lo a lot about this, you know, hindsight is always 2020. You know, you could go back at the end of this loan 23 years from now and really figure out the best time to refund it. And so I think what it is, is it's a question for you all in the member jurisdictions. You know, is this a level of savings that we believe is relevant enough to, to move forward with? You will have opportunities if you do the 2019 refunding, you will have opportunities to refund those bonds again. If I was betting, I'd say you'll refund them again. Maybe not until 2029 or 30, but there'll be a chance would be my suspicion. Um, but it's certainly an option to put to, to not do this and wait if, if you feel like there might be a better opportunity in the future. Ted, looking at the 10-year treasury chart, it's pretty low in 2012. So, mm -hmm. And it seems you know, kind of on par with what it is now. So if that was our issue in statewide, or... Well, we're well, now, remember, that at that time, you were selling a 30-year loan. Okay. Now you're no, selling a 10. Well, well, this is the marking a 10. But. Well, but, but now we're, we're only going out um, 22 Two years. years. Okay. So you can actually refund the bond just because time has elapsed. Right. Because back then, we were locking in yields or Take rates for a 30-year loan. Taking only eight years of risk. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because normally, our borrowing rate or our yield curve has a positive slope. The further you go out, the higher the interest rate is. All things being equal, we're now only going out 22 years, whereas we had been going out 30. And it's pretty flat now. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was not. It is pretty flat now, and you can see that on page 7. This is the tax-exempt yield curve, that dark blue, line, dark green line. But you can see when you go from year 20 to year 30, I mean, there's virtually no penalty to be going out an extra 10 years. Today. How flat it is right now. This chart on page seven, for what it's worth, this is a tax-exempt yield curve. And yes, we're talking about taxable, but in terms of perspective, the green bars are saying how many days have tax-exempt yields been lower than they are today since 1999. And when you get out to year 10 and beyond, it's not even 1% of the days where rates have been lower than they are today. So. The, the takeaway is we may not be at the absolute lowest, but we're, we're, we're darn close. Um, so anyways, there's some other market movement trends in there. Um, I think the, the key page for probably the next part of the discussion is, is going back to page five, which is those different levels of PV savings. And um, I'm happy to answer any more questions about the mechanics. Uh, Jesse, at, when you all are ready, can talk about the resolution that is in, there to be considered. Any questions? Have the member jurisdictions been briefed? Yeah. Shenandoah. Right after, right after your. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, yeah, Shenandoah I has been briefed. Uh, Warren County on Tuesday, okay. this coming Tuesday, and uh, Shenandoah will consider action next Thursday, and Rappahannock the following Monday. Okay. Having had more time than anybody else, I guess, to uh, consider this, um, of course, we tried this two years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, I was all for it. Uh, but one of the jurisdiction county decided not to do that, and I forget which one it was, but anyway. Um, I think it's a little lot shakier now than it was um, back then. Um, 
because we're getting closer to where we wouldn't have to refund this. I mean, we're only three years out on that. And back two years ago, everybody was talking that the interest rates are going to go up. Interest rates are going to go up. And they did. The economy was getting good. It got better. Um, now, everybody's talking about interest rates coming down. You know? And I know there's a lot of other factors in that. But we've been in a great economy for a long time. The economy goes up and the economy goes down. And it can't be too far out that our economy, and that includes the world economy, I mean, we see that has effect on, on bond rates. And so, um, as I saw it two years ago, it was a no-brainer, we should have done that. As I see it now, it's, a, it's very iffy that we might not, and as you look on page four, uh, as compared to page five, and you come over here to 11-122, three years from now, uh, and you look at the gross savings, and I realize if it stayed even, uh, we would have considerably more savings there, number one. Um, you wouldn't have to refund anything. Well, you, you would have to. It would well, still be a refund. Well, okay. It, okay. Wouldn't, it wouldn't have that escrow. It wouldn't have the escrow. Yeah, that's But you would, would have to it would, you would have to do a transaction. And, and uh, uh, you wouldn't have that. Plus, um, uh, you know, like I say, I see the economy not going up. I see it going down. When that's going to be, that's like picking the lottery. Right. You know, taking a lottery ticket. Uh, so I have a lot more concern this time around. Uh, didn't have much concern the last time around. And so um, the four million that we are putting in escrow or, or to pay that back wouldn't exist. Plus, you're also reducing the number of years. We're talking 22, 23 years remaining on our then. Then you're talking 20 or less. And so. Um, it, it becomes a, uh, a tough one for me just to say, okay, let's go forward uh, with this, even with of uh, some uh, mode of, you know, well, if, it, if the interest rates change enough between now and October 30th, we might not even do that. So that's just my two cents so, as I look at this. We're playing with the odds of probability. Ted, do you want to touch on the ability after 23 to be able to do a, a tax event once we hit that threshold? Yeah, so um, this, this if, if this were to move forward, this would be a taxable bond. Um, it would have a stated a 10-year no, no prepayment period. So you would be going to like 2029. Um, but the bond attorney that advises Virginia Resources has said that beginning, if you did this, beginning in November of 22, the call date of the original 2012 bonds, if the market supports it, you could refund the 2019 bonds with tax-exempt debt, go back to tax-exempt debt. Now, it doesn't mean that will that it will work, right? It depends on where rates are. But the opportunity will present itself on a tax-exempt basis as early as 22. Um, so, again, as I said earlier, it would, be a, it would be a departure from history for a 30-year loan not to probably be refunded twice, if not three times. It's just a function of how our market works. Rates move up and down, but every year the loan gets shorter and shorter. And so I can't certainly can't guarantee you that if you do this now, you'll have other opportunities to refund it. But it would be, it would be um, odd that you didn't have future opportunities to lock in additional savings. And when and how much is, remains to be seen. But according to the Virginia Resources folks, as early as 22 to at least be considering it again. Is, is that a scenario that you could calculate the break-even interest rate in 22? Are there too many variables come in play? 
there's a lot of variables. I mean, we've, we've, to do this deal, and then can we refund it again? Yeah, there's, there's, because you don't even know what the rate's going to be on October 30th. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a way to try to get there. Um, I don't know if it'd be super useful though, because yeah. you'd be making assumptions upon assumptions. Yeah, so right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the savings, again, back to whichever page you want to look at, the current market, they would begin in the current fiscal year, fiscal year uh, 2020. Yeah, I know, you, you know, Warren's a little over 50%, so depends on where you're in, you know, if you're at 7%, that's $75,000 a year for us, Dan, Mike. Two hundred, it's approximately hundred thousand dollars a year. That's uh, yeah. at the F and P. We initially said a minimum of seven percent. But certainly, Conrad, if uh, based on your comments, if you wanted to inch that number up higher and set the threshold, knowing we can always come back later, we can certainly do that as well. I think, I think you definitely need to do that. Well, I think it's, it's got to get to the point where is it enough? Is the juice worth the squeeze? Does it make right. enough sense to do it? Knowing that you might have an opportunity down the road. Mm -hmm. And we had the same discussion after Ted was finished the other night with county uh, funds, uh, and we just didn't feel like there was enough to go through the process. There was enough uh, savings for us to, to do it, so, so we didn't. But this is a much bigger bond uh, and uh, a, a bigger concern, but um, um, I definitely think it ought to be a half above 7%. You're looking That's at 9 well, I was thinking nine. nine. I was ten. thinking nine personally. Yeah, and, and just I'll along those point. lines, um, presumably um, every resolution, the authority in the three member jurisdictions will have the savings parameter. They don't all have to be the same. It's going to we're going to be guided by the one that's the most restrictive. So, if the last approval ups the minimum to some percentage, that's the one that. Carries. And we're at 17.44 as of just or two days ago. Right. So, you know, we're there, but we just don't know what's going to happen in the next 30 some days right. um, with that. So, for this to go through, every every county has to approve it. Correct. It's all or nothing. We lost out two years ago with one county. Mm -hmm. and, and the way the resolution is situated now is each locality would could pass a resolution that says the net present value saving no less than number. That's yeah. correct. Right, so then if it's five, seven, nine, nine's the number. Nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't carve out Warren at five, mm -hmm. Rappahannock at mm -hmm. seven. Rather it's than seven. try to make sure everybody passes the exact same number, mm -hmm. which then you would run out of time to kind of have this iterative process. Right, yeah. Because just the way that it's set up, the way the structure is set up in the deal, it's sort of RSW has issued this bond, but all of you members have issued support agreements that basically say, if there's some sort of shortfall, then everybody contributes based on kind of the percentage that we talked about based on ADP or whatever. And so everybody has to agree to that because that's kind of a common agreement that the members have that kind of overlays with the RSW agreement with Virginia Resources Authority. And for everybody's edification, the last time, a couple of years ago, we considered this, the net present value savings was at seven point it was right about seven and a half. Seven and a half. That's what it would have been Tax had we participated. Tax Correct. Tax but but same no. percentage wise, mm -hmm. same, yeah, same, same, same same thing. Yeah. So a nine would have be a better deal. Yes, if that's what you said than what we so had previously. A seven would be a worse. Worse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let me explain something just super briefly on the sort of the tax side of it. Um, as Ted has described, this is going to be a tax deal, no, no but that's only because we're in this very kind of weird environment where where both of those rates have gone so low that you're still getting a better deal doing it taxable than because you can't do it on tax. Oh, yeah. Right. But the taxable deal is better. But the, the point to what what Ted was saying before about what I mean, and our analysis on this is the same. VRA's bond council saying is. If we end up in an environment in the future where we want to flip this back to a tax exempt financing, that can still be done. Like the fact that as early made, as twenty two, right? The, the fact that you've made this taxable doesn't mean that forevermore it has to be taxable. 
and so long as you still guys are operating this as a you know governmental project and right. doing all that basic kind of stuff, you can still flip it back to that mode once we hit the point where we've refunded the the 2012 deal, we just kind of can't have the two series of tax exempt deals overlapping each other. So once those pay off, then it frees it up again to make it tax exempt again. I'm looking at it from a simple sense. In the foreign counties, looking at about $100,000. To be fair to the constituents, you're looking at a quarter of a percent of increase in taxes or a reduction. If we don't do anything, we're dead in the water. If we do something, we offset taxes one way or the other by a quarter of a percent, and that's a lot. You know, one percent equals just over four hundred thousand in our county. To be fair to constituents, if we can save, we should save. If that offsets taxes a little, we need to offset. If that's what this works for, regardless of the atmosphere in Warren County, we have to look out for the constituents of Warren County. There, am I willing to make a motion? Uh, Doug, I'll just speak up yeah. and uh, inform the other board members that uh, I communicated to the Rappahannock board that given Rappahannock's 6% stake in the savings that uh, I would recommend to our board and we'll vote, they'll vote last, that whatever the other two bodies come up with a percentage, that would be my recommendation. Just remember, you could jump up to a big eight percent. I could, year, so. uh, well, or I, we could do five, and then <laughs> no, that's right. Right. would have happened. But it weren't for those guys. Yeah, it seems to me a, a toss-up, one way or the other. Except that, personally, I feel like interest will go up. I still remember borrowing money to plant corn for twenty and a half percent. That was a while ago, but, but it, like I still got that distinct memory. <laughs> a long time. It stays with you for a didn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I know it's possible. I don't know. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like interest is going to go up. But yeah. I mean, it's I, been I, suppressed for a I while. I refined my house because right now it seems like kind of the time to do it. So that's, that's kind of my instinct. Yeah. I think it's. Do you need a motion? Yes, sir. I'll make a motion that we accept the proposal with a lock of 9%. 9% net present value. Yeah. Or higher. So yes, or higher. Is there a second? Second that. So, does that does that need to be phrased as approving the resolution with nine percent on the top of page two? Yes. That's what you might as well. Okay. So a motion and a second to adopt the resolution with a minimum threshold of net nine percent net present value of savings. And this will require roll call vote. Okay. Mr. Arm? Chair. Aye. 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 Mr. Aye. Chair votes aye. 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 Chair. Aye. Thank you all Thank very you much. Ted. Thank you. We will see uh, each see of you. Thursday. <laughs> Again, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Ted. <laughs> Thanks for your appreciation. Ted, do you have any this okay. time constraints? This is um, the same one I got the other day. For the Monday. Monday? Is this the same one? No, that's even that's more a, That's more up this morning. <laughs> um, email. I will. Yeah, it's, it may be one of my colleagues. We're trying to figure that out, but it's but we starts could, at two. We could push to seven, two. Uh, I think two works. Yeah. Okay. Is it two or three? Two. two. Yeah. But two. by the time you came up, it might be five. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, the superintendent was asked last time about uh, overtime, and you didn't address it during your comments. Uh, we're, we're actually going to discuss it later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All, right. Okay. All right. So, so item nine, request for a proposals contract award. Stephanie Yes. So um, the first contract we'll discuss is our pharmaceutical services contract, which we currently have with Westwood Pharmacy, and it is set to expire on October 1st, 2019. And due to this pending expiration, we sent out a request for proposals um, in June. Proposals were due in July, um, by which time they were due, we had received five proposal submissions for pharmaceutical services. After the review of all of the proposals and interviews with all five of the businesses that submitted proposals, our review committee has made the decision that we believe the best candidate for the award of this contract will again be Westwood Pharmacy. This decision was made based on many different factors, including their qualifications, their experience, our experience with them, and their cost proposal. 
uh, Westwood Pharmacy has proposed that all prescriptions in this contract, both brand name and generic, will be billed to our sub-regional jail at their acquisition cost, plus a dispensing fee of uh, $2.50 per prescription. Our current price model with them is based on average wholesale price minus a percentage. Um, so this would be a different cost format than we currently have. During our review process, um, in one of the references that we have um, with Westwood Pharmacy, they had changed price models as well and recognized the cost savings with them from going to one model to another. How long would this contract be? It would be a one-year contract that would start on October 1st of 2019, and it would have the option of extending the contract for two additional one-year terms. So overall, it could potentially be a three-year contract. And the uh, FNP recommended approval uh, as presented. And it's been reviewed by legal counsel. And it's been reviewed by legal counsel. Is there a motion to consider that? I'll make a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Dental services. Similarly, our dental services contract, which is currently with Rappahanna Creative Healthcare, is set to expire on October 1st of 2019. Um, we sent out the request for proposals, and by the time they were due, we had received one proposal, which was from Rappahanna Creative Healthcare. Um, excuse me. The cost proposal for that contract would be $36,000 annually, which will be billed to us in monthly equal installments of $3,000 per month. This is a $6,000 annual increase over our current contract price due to our increased inmate population from when we originally had that contract drawn up. It would also be a one-year term contract with the option of extending for two additional one-year terms. The maximum length would be three years. And that was the only proposal we received? That was the only proposal received for dental services, yes. I do like the idea of the flat fee, that way you're not, mm -hmm. you know, you can easier from a budgeting standpoint. So is a fixed number of days that they're here, or how does that work? The, 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 the dental services. The dental services. So just, they, they they, uh, two times a month. Okay. Two times a month. So okay. it's like the right. first and third right. Wednesdays or, or something like that. And is that a team? Just one person or a it, hygienist? It, a dentist and a uh, hygienist comes to assist them. Assist? Oh, no. Not a hygienist. Excuse me, your assistant. That's assistant. I'll say move. Motion by comrades or a second? Second. Mr. Murray. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 10, transport van discussion. Um, at the last month's FMP and this month's, or the previous meeting for the FMP, um, in our budget, we had budgeted to approve or to purchase two new vans um, for MA Transports. Through that, there was, uh, I believe it was 100, 100 excuse me, $95,000 was budgeted. I received quotes back to, for two vans with two inserts, and it came back at 122791 The reason for the increase as was not the vans. The vans stayed flat for the actual cost of the vans. It was the cost of the insert, which had increased, which when I was looking at budgeting for this, it was under the current insert that we have. The provider that makes manufactures the insert no longer manufactures that insert. They have got a newer, upgraded version which has additional cameras in it, has the ability to record from those cameras that we currently don't have, has intercom um, capability in it which can record the voice of the inmates being transported. So there's upgrades that they've done to the insert which have driven that cost up. Um, not to speak for the F, for the F and P, but the motion was from that previous meeting uh, was finance and personnel committee increased anticipated revenue from bed rentals by thirty thousand and increase and increased the anticipated expense for motor vehicles by thirty thousand. So, based upon the current numbers of contract beds that we have and things like that, that felt comfortable that our revenue that what we had projected is going to be more than what we had initially anticipated for, for bedroom revenue, which can cover the cost of the additional uh, expense of the transport vans. I guess it, did, we haven't had a full authority board meeting since the Culpeper agreement, right? Uh, 
you're right. We have mm-hmm. not. You should brief them on that. I apologize. Yeah. Um, which is which was a big factor into us being sure. comfortable to appropriate these dollars. I believe my dates in August um, of this year, we signed a contract with Culpepper to basically guarantee them 100 beds, 80 males, 20 females, um, for a year at $35 per MA per day to with an increase in a second year of $37 a day if they choose to do that. So what that does is it, it guarantees the bed for them that we have it, but there is also a clause in that agreement if we no longer can do it because we don't have space, we don't have staff, whatever, we can you know, get out of that agreement. So it's you've got that revenue if we can house those inmates of, of what it's going to accumulate to. And they pay us for the 100 inmates whether they have 100 they here or 50 here. They do. They're paying for 100 whether they use them or not. So with the guaranteed revenue, mm-hmm. we're that guaranteed revenue is already met our budgeted revenue for contract beds Correct. without considering page or any other revenue coming in from anybody Correct. else. Correct. More than met it. Correct. So the 30000 is definitely there. Yes. Nope. With the increased inmates is going to drive the need for transports as well. It really doesn't because we don't transport their inmates. So we don't mm-hmm. transport for page, we don't transport for coal purpose. The need for the additional vans to the, the mileage of the current vans we have is increasing. You know, they're well over 100,000 miles at this point. So the thought is is to try to use them more for local, get two new vans to use for the extended DOC runs. And there are several times throughout the month that we need additional vans to transport people back and forth to court because our numbers are so high and to get you know males and females segregated and things like that. So that is the need for the two additional vans. We don't do transport for pay okay. or for the <coughs> counties or any of the other, you know, principal that are for contract bets. It's not for the agreement. Any further discussion? Questions? I, I guess I'm just trying to, I'm trying to catch up. That what you were talking about, the ban was brought up at last month's P and P or P F and P. Two. Okay. So it was brought up at the F and P that we would need the additional funding for that. Right. And then the F and P made the motion to make that increase in the Recommending. Recommend the increase, excuse me, recommend the increase to the revenue line item of our budget by thirty thousand dollars to help cover the cost of or to cover the additional cost of those transport vans. We're bringing it forward now so that the board can make the final approval if you all choose to. Well summarized. In this way there's no additional cost to the jurisdictions. Correct. Right. This is last month or just today? No, it was last month, last and month. we brought it up. To, uh, we addressed it again today at this month. Yeah. So the FMP meets every month. Right, right. Do we get minutes of those meetings? We do, sir. Okay. And it's in your yeah, packet. It's in here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The minutes of that FMP. Yes, sir. Any further questions? Is there a motion? I move that we purchased two vans for just under 123000 with the new upgraded caging. Would you also include your motion on amendment to the budget for FY 1920 to include additional 30000 revenue for Beverly space and to increase the, um, the motor vehicle line cost of the block? 8208? I believe it is. Yeah, by 30000 Yeah. We can put that in. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? This is a legend amendment. You need a roll call vote. Yeah. Sure. Sorry. Aye. Shelby. Aye. Chair votes aye. Aye. Pass. Aye. 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 Sheriff. Sure. I'm fine with it. Okay. Approved unanimously. Thanks, Russ. F&P committee update. Mr. Vass, I know we have talked about most of the issues. Yeah, the, we have uh, not talked about. The, the only issue was that at the last finance and personnel, and that would be last being August 22nd, at the request of the full authority, the superintendent did brief us on uh, contract bed rental uh, and staffing, and we thought it would be prudent to bring that uh, to the full authority after that briefing. So we heard about it again this afternoon at our earlier meeting, and Russ, you wouldn't mind. Um, Sheriff, you 
brought up some questions at the previous meeting um, about how much overtime mandatory overtime staff are doing. So we ran the numbers from for fiscal year 19 from you know July of 18 to July of 19. And the way it broke down is it ended up being uh, for mandatory overtime, 40 hours per person for the entire year with a breakdown of 1.53 hours per pay period per employee for the year. Total overtime with the unknowns of hospital duty, additional transport, things like that, it was 57 hours per person for the year with 2.19 hours per pay period per employee for the year. Um, of course, some people work more, some people work less. Um, the worst case scenario, we had an officer that worked a total of 328 hours of overtime for that year, which ended up being, uh, I have my numbers here, it's about 12, about 12 hours of pay period. So he, he or she was working one additional shift every two weeks is what it ended up breaking down to. And that's not all mandatory. It is not on that. Some of that could have been voluntary. Some of, some, some of it was the unknown of you know hospital duty, other transports, things of that nature. All right. Um, I was looking at something else. I, I don't see minutes from the FMP in, in my packet. Maybe I'm maybe I'm misreading the, the attachments, but that's okay. I figured maybe I just didn't print them all, but I've got all 51 sheets, and I just went through the whole thing. I don't see it. Maybe I just don't understand what the labeling is. But anyway, Um Say that again. So does that sure. mean like every shift there's someone working overtime, basically? Um, I can't answer that, but based on the information I have, I could go back and look at schedules, but I, I can't. I, I'm saying is that we looked at total number of hours each employee worked, right, right. and I basically took that total hours, divided right. it by 26 pay periods right. to figure out how many hours per pay period that they were working. Each person. Each was person was working. And again, the averages were. The averages were 2.19 hours. That's total overtime hours divided by the total number of employees that worked overtime. So it ended up being 2.19 hours per pay period that they could have, you know, as if you spread it as an average. Some pay periods they probably had none. Others they probably had you know, 15 what, or 16 hours. Remind hours. me what the pay period is. It's two weeks. Two weeks every two weeks. So. Russ, do you pay benefits on the overtime? No, the benefits are for five okay. on 40. Because that's a hidden cost savings when you look at straight time wages with benefits versus time and a half. Coming from manufacturing, many times before we would hire, we would pay overtime. So how many people does that mean? How many, how many staff are you looking at? I'm sure yours is not there, Steve. Right, right. Our, our, we're not in that. that. That was looking at totally <coughs> officer. Right. I, it was 114. About 113, 114. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you know, and there are times. You know, there's times throughout the year that it's worse than others. You know, when we have an academy session in, they're probably working more mandatory overtime than when the academy session's not in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, it's, it goes in cycles. Right. So, you know, I had not looked at those numbers previously until you asked. So, you know, it was, it was good information for me to look at. I hope it's enough, you know, good information for you as a board. Um, you know. yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I appreciate it. I guess, um, um, yeah, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, and I, I don't want you to, I mean, you don't have to do this. If I mean, if you have time, you can do it. I mean, it would be nice to know. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, Every day you just have normal stuff to do. Every day. So how many people have to work overtime during that day just to get the normal stuff done? That's, that's well, what I'm wondering. Right, right now, we have an academy session in. It's typically one. Sometimes it's two. Depends on if I have people on vacation, right. things like that. Right. Typically, it's one to two. Staff members. Staff, Staff members. Per shift. Per shift. Just to do your normal stuff. Just to do the normal stuff. Right, right. And, and I think if I remember back from the last meeting, I think my, my concern was is if, if you know that it's taking, I mean, if, if that's what it is, one person or two people per day to just do the normal stuff, and you keep adding stuff to them, when's that going to go up to two people of overtime or three people per sure. day or that kind of thing? Sure. You know, that's yeah. at some point, some, th this body would need to know that, I think. Absolutely. And, you know, we're, we're at a point, obviously, that it's at a standstill. I mean, mm -hmm. I have two 
vacant units, 264 bed units that are completely empty. And I cannot and will not staff them until our numbers get better. Right. It's just not going to happen. I mean, we just can't, you know, our staff can't sustain that. Right. And I think that's the question that you're asking. So, you know, the housing, you know, every other housing unit for is operational except for those two, and they're two, you know, two of our largest units being 64 bed units. Right. So, you know, they're, if we were to reduce the number of contract beds, you're probably going to be able to close maybe one unit. Mm -hmm. So that could potentially save one person from working overtime, but right. we're still, and then we still, you know, because people have leave, they have sick leave, things like that, you may not save that because they may feel like they can take more you know, of their sick leave or whatever, and then I'm still going to have to backfill that position. If somebody calls out on me, I'm going to have to call somebody else in to fill right. that. You right. know, I don't have a relief factor, I guess, to cover right. when people are out. Right. Right. Okay. I guess the the factor is that you continue to recruit. We try to get our vacancy number down as low as eight. Right. And and all of our agreements for contract beds, they all give us an out of if we get to a point we can't because of staffing or whatever, then they've got to go back to where they came from. Right. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, to me, I mean, I think I understand all the talking points. You want to get outside money and you want to reduce the burden to the taxpayer. I get all that. But I also understand that if you got normal stuff to do and you don't have enough people to do the normal stuff and you keep adding stuff on top of the normal stuff, right. at some point this thing's going to break. Sure. Somebody's going to get hurt or, so, you know, stuff like that's going to happen. Absolutely. The concern um, was the number of hours being mandated. And mm -hmm. that was, again, to repeat, was 1.5. How much was it? We didn't know the answer. Man, well, no, know the, answer. Man, the mandatory was it oh. broke down for for July to July of last year. It was one point five three hours per, per person per pay period. So and a again, two week period, one and a half hours. Right, right. But again, that's you know if if you broke it down monthly, it's probably going to shake out different. There's yes, months sir. that they're working none, and there's months they're working more. But that's how it shook yeah. out for the year. Hey, you pull a twelve hour shift one month and nothing the next two. Yeah. And some people, they may be on the mandatory overtime schedule, and they don't want to work it, and somebody else does, so they'll give their day away. You know, so you've got people that are working less, and some people are working more, but they're volunteering to do that. And we still look at, you know, if people are volunteering to do it, we don't want them working the entire, you know, 14 days straight. That's We don't allow that. You know, so they, they do still have time off within that 14-day you know, period. All right. Thank you, guys. All, I believe, needed updating from our committee that hasn't otherwise been acted. I know, I, I know, Mike. I think last year we were quite close to three hundred thousand of your staff. How many sworn officers do we have? Um, seventy-three. So seventy-three versus one fourteen, and we're running about fifty percent over on the overtime. So yeah, so we're, well, we're a lot of extra time. I know. Yeah. Um, meeting schedule: Our next scheduled meeting, November twenty-one, two o'clock. Please mark your calendars, and um, we'll have to have some cake for Mr. Murray down here. And Mr. Hayes. I miss out. Yeah. Both of us. Anything else? And Sheriff Arnold. <laughs> and Sheriff Arnold. <laughs> we need three cakes. Will you retire? <laughs> I'm not going to be on this <laughs> Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you.